Okay. So the art of war is the authored by Sun Zi. Basic, if you read the uh, paper, uh, this one is uh, uh, from Columbia University. And then um, I assume there will be pretty good translation. Uh, basics, if you know, it's about Confucius time. It's in the warring uh, warring uh, state before the warring state. Um, the author, so called Sun Zi. Okay, again, Zi is the Mister, so it's the Mister Sun. Uh, legendary, his name is Sun Wu. Okay, but nobody sure. Okay, just like Tao Te Ching, Lao Zi. We are not sure it really has this person or people, you know, collected all the paper and uh, uh, do it. So we don't know. So uh, luckily, this um, book, Sun Zi, is very short, okay, and probably shorter than uh, Tao Te Ching. Okay, so only have a 13 chapter. Uh, I don't know other people do this way or not. That's the way I organize this 13 chapter. Okay, I, the, you, you, I, I'm not sure there's other people, uh, other scholars or, or organize this way or, or not. I don't know, but I just feel that's the way I organize. So from one to four basics, uh, this book are talking about the military philosophy, okay, and talk about the political stage, okay before you go into the war, while you are going to do something. Okay, that's the first part from one to four. And from five to eight, it's talking about kind of like, call, I call it the military science, okay, during the planning stage. Okay, talk about uh, uh, all the planning and uh, what is going to happen during the war, okay. And the last five chapter basically talk about in the practical stage, I call it the military strategy. Basically talking about in the field, uh, geographic, how to use fire, here's how to take use fire because during the ancient time, fire is important weapon. And talking about spy, how to do double, double spy, all this kind of, not linked to like a step-by-step -step strategy, but basics, you talk about this kind of thing. So I assume this group, people coming here is because you are interested in philosophy. So, and the same as this paper the, from Columbia University, uh, I think he put many translation on that. And all of them are from chapter one to chapter four. Okay, so basics, it fit my uh, idea because uh, we will be less interested to study the rest of them. So today we will focus on chapter one to chapter four. And the, the, if you read this paper, uh, I think all the, I just reorganized in different order, okay, from chapter one to chapter four. Okay, not all chapter, but um, I will say 50%, okay, of the text. So you can see the text is not that long, okay. The reason, Okay, so by this time, any question, any concern, anything you want to share? Yeah, I, ha I have a question. I know we're not looking at beyond four, but where is logistics located in here in the military uh, planning stage? Uh, is that under contingencies and not, I mean, because the logistics seems to be a very important I don't, element. I don't see the logistic, but it talk about logistic at the very beginning. Okay, they'll talk about logistic. I think it's even on the chapter one or something, they talk about that. Okay. Jason, right. I, think yeah. I think we're I, Okay, so who is speaking? Jason, this is Rubana. I have a question. This is my first time. Yeah. And I just found you guys. Um, is this book more like, um, you know, I've heard that the Vietnamese have a book uh, on going to war, and and is, is this like the something that the generals have done together, or is this like a, uh, the book, the Prince from um, Machiavellian? Okay, more, it's more philosophical. 
Okay, I'll put it this way. Okay, I don't know the Vietnamese version, but I heard they translate from Chinese. Okay, but I'm not, I, definitely I have no idea what you what the question Vietnamese reading. Okay, but I heard, of course, it can be biased. Okay. So, and, hey, J Jason, so yes. I will say that the, the big difference between Machiavelli and Sun Tzu is Machiavelli is more of a political advisor, right? I mean, he's advising actual policies and how to manage the power between the different uh, parties and regions and princes. Uh, Sun Tzu actually administered wars, right? I mean, he actually oversee and oversaw actual battles. So his point of view is, you know, some of that um, preparation is um, can be, you know, touched to politics and supply chain and all that stuff. But, you know, a big part of what's addressed here is in conducting the war as a whole enterprise, right? It's a little different okay. than the politics. Okay, so we have a lot of people. So right now we pass, pop, uh, please use uh, raise hand. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, uh, we have a uh, pin, uh, fear and the type. Oh uh, yeah, uh, uh, Phil, Phil's question, and uh, I, I think you already said that, Jason. Yeah, it's, logistics is very important, but it's spread. It's kind of throughout the book. It's, um, you can tell it's, in, um, it's on the writer's mind as an extremely important thing. Um, but the thing is, I, I would see, um, Sun that's actually kind of a pacifist is one very fundamental philosophy is, is that um, war is one of the worst things that a state can exercise. So it has to be justified, serve a, a purpose, uh, a political purpose, uh, or an economics has to be uh, in the calculation uh, as a last resort. Um, and uh, even if you decide to conduct war uh, because there's no other better option. See, Sun Tzu was very, very against, uh, I think, you know, he really pointed out that fighting a war for territory was was uh, meaningless. You know, it was uh, yeah. stupid, basically. And um, even when you decide to conduct war, the worst kind of uh, strategy is to kill the enemy and take over territory and uh, and actually engage in battle. The the best kind of fighting is when you uh, defeat the enemy without even fighting. So I think he is, is I, I often see it when it's discussed uh, in the West, somehow that doesn't really come through, you know, that, that, that really fundamental to his thinking. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, just quick to respond to uh, another question about the Machiavelli, okay. And uh, what uh, Chris talked about is right. Yeah. And the Machiavelli basics is, the point of the thing is uh, uh, honest on dishonesty, okay? Honest on political dishonesty. So basically, he is talking about, uh, you know, uh, more on the political side and advice on the prince, not really on the war, okay? So uh, next one is fear. And okay, so I just like to remind everybody, we have a few stuff going on, then and I put your conversation on the general idea, not going to the detail, and we are going to decide detail for the couple slide. Okay, so Phil, please. Yeah, uh, I have a question. It seems to me from what I read, because I don't know this text at all, from what I read you assigned, it seems like a very early form of psycholog psychology or psychological warfare it, 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 it is an important part uh, to the degree that you could use it effectively it would cause the least harm because you might not be you might need not even go have to go to war 
because you have, in a sense, won the psychology of it already. So is this an early form of psychology? Because it's about the human mind rather than, well, in relationship to, I guess, physical force, but the human mind and seeing where the weaknesses of the other is lying and take advantage of that weakness so that you don't have to use as much force. I mean, is that what it's basically about? You are asking the question? Yeah. Yes, that's a question. Yeah, okay, we will see later. But thank you for sharing, and psychology definitely is a part, but I personally, I don't see that's the only part. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we will see in a few uh, 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 minutes. So we have the Thai, Audrey, and the Lindsay. Thai, please. It's, uh, okay, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm here. Can yeah. yeah, please. Okay, because again, it's my phone. All right, so I have a, a couple of points. I would probably say that um, I would agree with the speaker who talked about Machiavelli being more uh, of basically an, an outline to winning, and that is to say, you know, for aristocracy or, you know, monarchical purposes, you would you would want to kill any descendants. Like basically, Machiavelli tells us to kill babies, right? This is this is an opposite to that, insofar as it's kind of just like generalities with regard to how you should approach sort of the bigger picture rather than the micro. Um, the second point I'd like to make is someone suggested that, in fact, the author was a direct advisor for war. It was my understanding that historically there may have been multiple authors for these texts. And so if someone knows more, I, I would like to more like to know more about that. Um, and then finally, just as kind of a question for like later, how do we situate this piece, you know, into the broader understanding of like, Asian religions and and how do you divide that piece? Because you know the Eightfold Path is all about not being deceptive and and the like, and so and, and acting with integrity and compassion, and this is quite an opposite to that. So that's all. Um, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, the authorship actually is undetermined. Okay, so we probably don't have to discuss too much. <clears throat> On the authorship, we just assume this is a book and we read it. And about the Asian culture, uh, yeah, of course, you all tie to the Asian culture, but we cannot resolve today. So <laughs> that's a whole project for many years. So uh, you have to come every week for a few years. Uh, thank you. And the next one is Audrey, then Lindsay. Oh, hi. Oh, first of all, I was. Uh, going to uh, answer Phil because but that was a while ago so I think <clears throat> Finn might have answered it but I thought fielding the army under military strategy practical stage and um, nine kinds of grounds and attacks with fires I thought that had to do with logistics just by the titles so, I mean I haven't looked there but it seemed like they would deal with logistics in that um, what I'm a little confused about we read we what you told us to read and what you're giving us now. So what we what we read is just sort of a, a mini background. Is that what I have here? And then I'm following this these 13 chapters or these first four chapters. I'm a little confused between the reading and what we're doing now. Okay, so I shall answer your question later. Uh, uh, yeah, um, the, I, the assumption on this project what I'm, I'm doing is I assign the reading and give you some background and I will assume uh, you will read them and you have a question. What I'm doing is I try not just 100% reproduce what we have. I kind of like today's case, I, I also read the paper and I find out that we probably need a global view on the whole book. That's my part. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm just that makes it very clear to me. Yeah. So I do have a question then about um, knowing when one can and cannot do battle is victory. I mean, I, um, you want me I lost my I lost my place. Well, that that one we can leave for the I think the uh, the one of the slide. That's an important. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Please don't go to too much detail on that. And the today's uh, uh, slide, what I'm doing is everything is, I think most of them are in this paper. I just reorganize because- yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to take up any more time. I, I'm just trying to get my bearings. You know, I've been out for a couple yeah, of- Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Lindsay, please. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's chapter two is the chapter about logistics, how to sharpen your weapons, how to be prepared, how to forge, blah, blah, blah. Just glancing through that, that's the chapter that deals with what you do to be prepared for those contingencies that are going to come up when you actually engage. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris. Hi, right, so I think um, um, from my point of view, I, this will be, I think it will be helpful to approach the book like a self-help, self-guided book, right? Uh, I don't know how many people that read the book uh, on investing. It's a classic investment book by Benjamin Graham, right? Uh, or like, you know, um, say how to, you know, how to play guitar for dummies, right? I think you should look the book David versus like a book that, that he wrote, you know, from a religious or psychology or any like particular discipline point of view. He is telling you, this is based on his experience, right? And, and philosophy, how best to win, in this case, war or any type of competition. Uh, it's a how-to book, a very, very useful how-to book. Uh, that that's probably first and foremost how people should read it versus, you know, apply some more deeper meaning into it. Yeah, thank you for sharing. But I know at the end, we will see how we feel because every, okay, so uh, how do we feel in this book? I think I put this one in the end discussion, we can see, see. But again, I'm not going to, we are not going to do all these 13 chapter, but basically we focus on the first four chapter, which I believe is more on the philosophical uh, thinking. So uh, Rubana, please. Hi, I have two questions. One is um, about the language it was written in. It's written in ancient Chinese, right? And yes. I, I, are you uh, able to still read that? Because um, I work at the Art Institute in Chicago and we have panels of in, written in ancient Chinese. And I see that uh, Chinese tourists who are able to read that ancient Chinese. So that's my first question. And two, my second question is, um, can we use this book in our, even though it was written 2,500 years ago or, 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 or so, can we still use what's in this book for today uh, in life and or in our political life? So those two are my questions. Well, answer your second question, then we will put in the discussion, you know, just Good example is the Bible is written 2,000 years ago, and we still read it. And how are we going to use this one? Or you say, oh, that's no use, right? Same as all the Plato's dialogue. You know, I, that, that's my personal view. But you know, we can discuss later about ancient Chinese. I just show the screen. Uh, that's the ancient Chinese writing. And in each slide, I will uh, include the ancient Chinese uh, writing, and then. I believe most of people, well, not all, I believe the younger generation probably cannot understand well, you know, and the foreign learn Chinese probably don't get it. Okay, so uh, that's, of course, that's just my, my personal view on that. So, uh, Pin, please. Oh, hi, Jason, just a follow up. Um, I you. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, for point out chapter two, uh, yeah, it says a lot about logistics and uh, kind of you know, answering the question, can we still use, it? is it still relevant today? I remember I read chapter two probably, you know, 15 years ago in the early years of the Afghan, the U.S. war in Afghanistan, and I found it very interesting. And today I would encourage you know, if you're interested uh, to read that chapter on your own and draw your own conclusions. Uh, the main point of the chapter is basically a long war is never a good war. Um, and um, so uh, also to say, yeah, um, it's, this book is extremely influential and popular even today. Every time I walk into a Chinese bookstore, there's yet yeah, a new book written by someone today on how to apply uh, Sun Tzu in management, in personal life, 
in relationships. Uh, so the, I would say even in fairly popular culture, uh, Chinese culture today is seen as a very useful philosophy book, kind of in the metaphor that uh, you know, life is a battlefield. Uh, and can we still read it? Yeah, uh, just like Jason said, certainly um, someone like me, I can read the, read the original and understand pretty much all of it without much, uh, a whole lot of difficulty. It's actually, uh, as far as books written at that time, this is one of the easier books to read. Yeah, I agree with Pin, yeah. And uh, Pin, but, but don't take Pin as an example. He's exceptional. So <laughs> not everybody like Pin can read uh, the ancient Chinese text without difficulty. Okay, so. And the Sun Tzu, again, Sun Tzu is, among that time, Sun Tzu is the easy one to read. That's true. Uh, Evelyn, please. Evelyn, you okay. Uh, Madeline? Yes, um, oh, I'm here, sorry. Um, I was wondering, I noticed um, in the 36 stratagems, a yep. lot of them were very brief, you know, like those four character things. And then there was a sentence, but the English, as always, the English translation of the, of the few characters was much longer. And I didn't know if you had prepared or maybe you could just do on the fly when we get to the stratagems, if you could just do a few like literal translations word for word. Okay, uh, thank you, Madeline. I probably don't have, we probably don't have time to talk about this. And uh, if uh, we show enough interview, I probably have to run another section to go a little bit more on the 36 uh, stratagems. And if you can see on this uh, Sun Tzu's book, uh, more philosophical part on the first four chapter, and you probably can see the 36 strategy kind of like developed from the military strategy part, like uh, how to use spies, so become more practical. So 36 strategies is more on, I call it the vulgar, you know, uh, uh, military strategy. Uh, so a lot of things uh, have the historical background. So uh, this one, this uh, Sun Tzu is written about 25,000 years ago, about 500 BCE. And the 36 strategy probably not uh, come out until 200, 300 CE. Okay, so that's much, much later. And then the reason it's important I, in my point of view is in today's Chinese culture, in the daily conversation, um, a lot of words are from 36 tradition and also from Sun Tzu, this book. Even most of the Chinese, I say Chinese means the person who use Chinese as a language doesn't read Sun Tzu or read the 36 tradigens, but we use on the daily conversation. If I recall, Okay, I uh, let's say when I'm in Taiwan and then I speak, I use Chinese all day long. If I recall I, every day's conversation, I probably will use at least once or twice, okay, on the uh, 36 stratagem or the words from Sun Tzu, okay. So that's how popular it is. Even you don't have to read this one. You go to the street, go to the uh, wet market, market, they probably understand that you said, uh, 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 some words like you know, okay, I one I win on hundred battles, or I or I win a hundred battle on hundred battles, and they know what I'm talking about. But they he, did, he didn't read the Sun's. Okay, so that's why it's important. Okay, okay let's move on. Uh, again, all the book we should. I always want to start from the uh, chapter one, sentence one, because it. Uh, uh, the definition of the military, okay, the, the force. So uh, let me read the very first sentence. That's the very, very first sentence. He said, the military is a great matter of the state. It is the ground of life and the death, the way of survival or extinction, okay? So that's like everybody have to memorize. Military 
It's big thing. It's not just a game. Okay. So it's life and the death regarding your country's survival or extinction. So then Sun Tzu lay out the five important, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, factor, okay, about the military, okay, so, so called the uh, Tao, okay, or the way, or somebody translates as moral law, that's Tao, heaven, earth, the general, which means commander, and the method of or discipline, discipline or whatever. Okay, so basically this five factor, okay, so it's, that's the very beginning, very clear. He tell us how important this one, this one is about life and the death for the person. It's about the survival or extinction, okay? Then five factor, the Tao causes the people to be in complete accord with their ruler so that they will follow him, the ruler, regardless of their lives undismayed by any danger, okay? That's kind of moral teaching. Then second, talk about the heaven. Heaven signify yin and the yang, cold and the heat, time and the seasons, okay? Talk about, there's something we cannot control that's in the heaven, okay? And the, the earth, which we already have, okay? Which country, you are island, you are big land, you are in the desert, okay? The, the earth, Composes distance, great and small, danger and the security, open ground and the narrow passes, the chances of life and the death. The number four is the people, okay, the commander, the general, stand for the virtue of the wisdom, sincerity, benevolence, courage, and the strictness. Okay, so we talk about the quality of the general. Okay, remember they have some moral teach, not only wisdom. Sincere, 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 and the benevolence. Okay, that benevolence that's also important. That's in the Confucius teaching. Okay, then the method. Okay, when we talk about logistic, okay, it, that's what I mean laid out here. The method or discipline are uh, to understand, understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivision, the graduation of rank among the officers. So we talk about the military system, the ranking, okay, the organizer system, the maintenance of the road and the by which supply may reach the army, the logistic, okay. And the final thing, the control of military expenditure, the finance situation. So on the very first chapter, very first uh, paragraph, Sun Tzu lay out the the importance and the, some fundamental factor about the military. Okay, so any question, any comment on this one? Uh, Joe? So what I found interesting, one of the earlier speakers uh, suggested that this was a very benevolent way of thinking and they really wanted to avoid war. But the five things you have in here, this is not benevolence by any means. This is how to fight. The, uh, the notion of you want to get your enemy to go into passes. Well, what happens when they go into passes? They usually get slaughtered. That's the whole idea. You want them in narrow passes. So I don't really get the idea that somehow, you know, this is not uh, a military. This is extremely military. And it, 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 the violence is just part of having the military. So that the notion that this is somehow not related to war is violence is a little hard to fathom. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I will, we can discuss this one and because, uh, okay, if we read the Tao, Tao De Jing, Lao Zi, Tao De Jing, okay, so you will see that kind of ac action without action, winning without fighting, that's what we call, okay, so uh, that's the subtle part, uh, but, you know, anybody can have an answer on that, so uh, we will see later, yeah. Uh, let's have Mark P. Yeah, I um okay. I haven't read this in a really long time, so um, Pin probably needs to correct me here. So I might be misinterpreting what Pin was saying, but um, I don't think um, so. I think Pin used the word pacifist. I think that might be a little strong. I don't think it's it's um moral in that sense. I think it's more about um economy of action i mean the goal is about winning right but winning is not often um effectively done by counterposing force against force 
Um, if you can use intelligence, um, you can avoid the opponent's force and then use your force where the opponent is weak. So the end result can be a conflict that's more about maneuver than force against force. So I, I think, I think, and now, and, and I hope, it, Pim hopefully will correct me if this is correct. It's, it's not a moral, like describing as pacifist is not really like a moral way of describing it. It's just like, it's not a crude, brutal approach to conflict. It's more kind of like of a finesse approach. That's my understanding. Thank okay. You. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I just like to mention that's at the big, at this stage, that's kind of hold personal opinion, how to interpret this and uh, to the end. Okay. So the only reason I'm not, I'm not saying we should not discuss, we should discuss later. But right now, let's make sure we have a common understanding on this one. It's moral or it's immoral. It's uh, about then we can talk about it. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pim, please. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for the question and pointing out uh, what is, uh, inconsistencies and what I said. Uh, yeah, very well said, Mark. I agree with Mark. I, I think what I was trying to say, yeah, probably is pacifist was uh, too much of a loaded word uh, that I didn't realize. Um, uh, sounds, uh, I, I think what I was trying to say is it's very uh, that he emphasized how serious warfare is. And it has to be justified. You don't just uh, uh, willy-nilly go into war because you're, you're uh, for pride, for um, just uh, fighting over territory, uh, yeah, because of the human lives and uh, the cost of human lives and economics that's, uh, that's behind the war. So I always really enjoy reading those parts of the Sons of uh, that scene, basically the, the big picture of war, that it's not about fighting, really. It's, it discusses a lot. But there are also a lot about what, what all the resources, all the losses, all the costs, yeah, are various kind, tangible and intangible costs that go into a war. And uh, but there is uh, definitely, a, 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 I thought uh, Jason laid it out really well, that he does get to tactical things. Uh, such as you know, trapping your your enemy, uh, where to attack, when to attack, things like that. So it's not that he doesn't teach you about how to fight a war. When, but part of the philosophy there is also if you're if you can't fight, you know, if you decide that war first of all is actually necessary, and you can't use means such as scaring away your enemy uh, before you uh, you even fight. That you actually get to the fighting, you want to, you want to, to, you want to win as quickly as possible, to minimize all the other resources and costs that go into it. So that's why he goes into these tactical things. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that that's the thing is, I think if you read the entire book, um, hopefully this this would uh, will come through and uh, and resolve some of the. Uh, apparent inconsistencies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think the, uh, that's in the, uh, I think so in chapter three, I think. Um, uh, the purpose of the today is not to understand everything, but at least, I think this one, if you feel if this book is interesting, is useful, and uh, you can uh, continue to read it. And uh, then, that's the, then that means I achieved the purpose. So, uh, but Daniel, please. <clears throat> yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I remember when we did the sign reading for this that said um, military people and business people are using this, business people too. And then I was thinking, like, it seems like a problem that business people are doing this dog eat dog, super cutthroat kind of mentality. And not to get too political, but I think that's a big problem with our system right now is it's just like, lots of people get left behind and it's this really dog eat dog economy and stuff like that so if they're using these methods for business purposes i think that's really dangerous actually but anyways, it's just, oh, okay. thank you for the comment yeah uh, that's another issue we we can discuss later just like a gun you know you can use to protect yourself you use to kill people so it really depends on how 
how you use all nuclear nuclear uh, energy you use for weapon or use for the energy. So uh, that, that's another issue now. Uh, Phil, please. Yeah, it seems to me he, he is, well, this document is trying to say that if the Tao is one, his manifestations also have a structure of oneness, and that oneness in society, a culture, a civilization, a particular city, uh, in order to be one, has to be unified uh, as one whole, so therefore the parts within the whole must have a unity uh, rather than a separation. So therefore, in a sense, it has its structure. It is not the Tao, but is one of the manifestation of it in civilization. If that's the case, then in a sense, uh, just like a human being, if you're threatened, even if you have to sacrifice your arm, a part of one, you would sacrifice the arm in order to protect the wholeness of the one. So in that sense, it is a manifestation, which is the downgrading of the Tao, but it is a manifestation that wants to have a unity of oneness within the structure itself. It seems to me that's what it's saying. That's why even if you are part, you're part, the army, the individual soldier in the army must understand that it is part of the whole that's act to defend the whole of the city itself, the civilization itself. So one must, the end of oneness of an individual must surrender himself to the oneness of the of this particular whole, unless you want to leave the city and just live in oneness with the Tao. Well, th thank you. And I oh, thank you, Theo. Um, I think you know, I will encourage everybody at this stage, kind of think about the how, how Sun Tzu is teaching, okay, instead of over explaining what uh, uh, he's, uh, what we can use this one that come later. So I'd like to suggest everybody focus on talk about the Tao, talk about the heaven, talk about the earth, talk about the general, talk about the method. Okay, that's how he lay out. Okay, and you know, that that that's I uh, the way I read it. Yeah, uh, we have iPhone twelve twenty five. Please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, oh, it's cool. Elena, okay. and sometimes for some reason I don't know why my iPhone doesn't identify me. Sometimes okay, um, so uh, I just want to bring a question. So looking at this, so there is a Tao that causes people to be in complete accord with their ruler and a general that's, that, um, that's just the supreme commander, supreme being there that applies method and discipline to impose and promote the interest of the Tao in this particular case, or what Phil said, manifestation of the Tao. And uh, I just wonder whether the general is being appointed by the Tao or the general promotes himself and appoints himself. And then he uh, acts in accordance with the law of nature and uses Tao and Tao supports the general in this particular state. And that's how do these particular factors connect it in this um, philosophy, military philosophy, and the, and the vision. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Uh, my personal understanding is a general. I, in at least in this book, we just assume they have the general, okay, who is in charge of the military. And the, probably this book is written. The audience, what I believe, the audience is the general, okay, the chief commander. I, I believe that's the case. You know, if you take it to the business point of view, probably talk about the manager or the business owner. So, and that's my understanding. Uh, Martina? Ma, no, Madeline, please. <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> so the Tao, uh, it can be the Tao Te Ching, but it also mean, really means the way or the path. Mm -hmm. So people who are in accord with the way or the path uh, soldiers are, or citizens are going to follow their ruler. Then I see basically um, 
that heaven is signifying time and earth is signifying space. The general seems to be, I mean, we'd, we'd think of him as, um, or possibly her, who knows, um, yeah. upper level manager, upper, upper level management. Uh, sorry, someone's chat has popped up in, in front of what I'm looking at. Um, but it could also be the benevolent ruler, like the sage ruler who we, we encounter in the Tao Te Ching. And then it seems as if um, the, God damn. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to turn off my chat. I can't, uh, can't see anything. There we go. Okay, um, so by method and discipline are to be understood the marshalling of the army in its proper subdivision. So it's almost as if this whole thing is going from um, the very large level of organization to the very small. Uh, and that, that number five would be Phil's logistics. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I think you, I, 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 but I'd like to mention three things important, heaven, earth, and the general, the people. Right? So that's common in Chinese thinking, okay? If you, everything you want to do, uh, be successful, three things, heaven, which something you cannot control, right? That's it. going to rain, you're going to have a storm, that's something, heaven. Second is the earth, okay, what your situation, your current situation, right? And the third thing is the people. That's the only thing you can deal, okay? So that's in the general uh, Chinese thinking is in this way. So heaven, earth, and the people. And here in the military, it's heaven, earth, and the general. So uh, let's go to all the Fred, Phil, and the Pim. Okay. Um, the question is regard to, to uh, definition number two regarding the heaven. It's one that I, I kind of least I guess, understand of the, these five in that um, up until the 20th century, uh, weather and the seasons played a, a dominant role in war. You had, a, you had a, a war season. So you'd have pitched battles in Europe until the troops had to go home and harvest their crops and prepare for winter. And then everybody took off, everybody broke broke off almost by, by implicit agreement until spring. And then they'd engage in war again. Uh, that's much less true now. So the, the question that I would have is whether this uh, number two, do, does it signify the, uh, the importance of, uh, of weather and seasons to the conduct of war uh, and um, if so is is that antedated does it still apply i i, I would say still apply but you, you should not take us a, a, a limited interpretation as a weather right you can consider something you always have something not in your head uh, when you want to do something, they always have something not in your head, not only the weather. That's why I call yin yang, which <laughs> you can represent, you can say it, be anything. But that's my understanding, yeah. Uh, who's next? Uh, Phil, Kim, and Mark. Well, the, the, prob the problem with the manifestation is that every stage of manifestation is uh, to a certain degree imperfect imperfect in this manifestation of the oneness. So therefore, particularly when you get to the general or actually civilization, because the, the emperor is there too, uh, the corruptibility of individuals within the system does not mean that it could even manifest even beyond heaven and earth, a clear alignment. So therefore the corruptibility means that in a sense, it could uh, dissipate the oneness even of society. So therefore, in a sense, you're depending on, in a sense, a system that acts works well to, to, in a sense, lessen the corruptibility of individuals that are made in a system that is by nature corruptible. So therefore, 
it is never going to be a perfect manifestation because it is a manifestation rather than the Tao itself. So therefore, one has to take account of that. And that's why when you look at a, a different army, you could look at the corruptibility of their system and take advantage of that corruptibility as well, as long as yours is less corruptible than theirs. <laughs> so it's, it's relative in that sense. That's what I think. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just want to remind everyone, uh, we already spent one hour and uh, I'm only on the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you know, yeah, uh, but I'm, is corruptible. <laughs> I, I just remember, don't take personally and then because I want to move on. And, and, hey, hey, Jason, Jason, okay. can I just make one recommendation? So on each page that you have, right? Yes. The, Probably the same person can only make comments once. That's part of what move it along much faster. You can't, if you can't have the same person come back on like, you know, three or four times because then you never move off. Okay, so that's, I will cut off on the, uh, I think we have a pin, Mark and the Audrey, then I'm going to move on. Okay, pin. Yeah, sorry, I'm one of those people who came on uh, four or five times. <laughs> yeah, uh, for a great point. Um, you know, I look at uh, Sun's original writing about Tao, uh, you know, basically, I, I think he's saying you need some kind of a motivating factor so that a, a purpose for the war that you wage, so that the people are actually see the higher purpose and be willing to risk their lives to go with you into this war, uh, the soldiers. So it could be any number, it could be we're fighting for our, the survival of our nation, or we're fighting for democracy. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, it could be different uh, under different situations, but he just pointed out that you do need something to motivate people that's, that's, that's of a higher purpose. Um, also, just a quick comment on the on the heaven, the weather. I, even in modern warfare, weather still. I, I agree with Jason. It, it's the 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 heaven is, is bigger than just weather. But it's even just the weather thing is still a very important factor in conducting modern warfare. Our ability to conduct uh, air bombing campaigns, for example. I remember during the Yugoslav uh, the um, U.S. Uh, operations in Yugoslavia. Uh, the generals, the U.S. generals there would often point out the contrast with uh, conducting uh, air operations in, in Iraq because uh, the climates are, part of it becomes, uh, the, the climate was a very important factor. Okay, uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, I wanted to agree with and, and the previous speaker and point out, say that I think the, the heaven aspect is a, is a little less relevant now than it was then, but it's, it's still relevant. Like he includes um, Sun Tzu in here under the heaven, not just weather, but the day night cycle too. The US for years has favored night operations in Afghanistan because they have infrared technology like um, on their soldiers and they use infrared uh, strobe lights to identify their positions and searchlights and stuff. And the Taliban doesn't have that technology. So they've, at, for years, they, they prefer to operate at night. Um, and then the other thing, I wanted to make a general comment about Dow, and I'm probably gonna say something wrong. So I'd like Peter and or Lynn to correct me. But I just wanna say Dao is a pretty common word in Chinese. Like if you say, I understand, you could say Woji Dao. That's the same Dao as in Taoism. So it's not necessarily like this really obscure mystical concept and my understanding is that the whole modern idea that we have of Taoism didn't exist at the time that this book was written like that was something that was created later I think by Sima Qian when he was categorizing different philosophers he put them into this category of kind of like Taoism and that was much much later so the author of this book isn't necessarily thinking about Tao in the way that we would think about it in terms of Taoism um, that, that's the point that I wanted to make. And then please correct me, the Chinese, native Chinese, if, if, you, if that seems wrong. Yeah, I don't, I, I, thank you, Mark. You know, I, I, I don't think na native Chinese will have advantage, you know. Yeah. 
no better than you. So we will, we are all equal. You know? So that's my understanding. Okay. So uh, and the, the, I I do like to the end. I put a slide to discuss the Tao because remember I think last month Pin make a presentation like Confucius Tao and the Lao Tzu Tao are they the same? So here comes another Tao. Are they the same? You know. So it, it's a very vague, very different understanding. It's you know we probably don't have to discuss today, but. You know, that's a very worthwhile to think about. Uh, Audrey, please. Well, yeah, I think that all five of these are so interrelated that you, I mean, if you think of it as a, as a hierarchy and one is the Tao, which gives you the idea that you have to be in, a, which tries to keep you in accord, you still might not have that accord if you ignore the heavens and the seasons and maybe it's a stupid time to go to war you know, or you don't need to go to war. Um, and so why would anybody be in accord with you if you if you mess up or don't pay attention to the heaven because there's some wisdom in knowing, you know, your strategy. And the same with earth and the distances and, and the dangers. And, you know, you don't send um, people that have never been in, in, in cold weather without any clothing. You know, there would be, you know, people would die and, and you would lose your, uh, the attention and, the, and the, uh, the loyalty of your soldiers. And the general has to pull all this together with wisdom. So uh, otherwise the method won't work, you know, and the, but then it goes back up again from the method all the way back up to the Tao. And I find it really, really interesting that if this was a, a way to follow, you would have inscrutable and wisdom happening at the same time. Um, anyway. Thank you. Thank you for uh, explanation. Uh, uh, I think next one would be Ruben, Tai, and uh, Lindsay. Ruben, uh, right? Ru oh, uh, I'm sorry. Tai and Lindsay will be for before me, but. Okay. Yeah. Tai, Lindsay, and uh, uh, Ruben. Yeah. Tai, please. Uh, hi, just really quickly, um, I think in so far as answering, and again, I have no advantage. I mean, I'm a refugee, but uh, I don't speak, uh, I'm a refugee from Vietnam, half Chinese, but I don't speak the Chinese language or anything. But I think in terms of understanding the Tao versus the Tao, it's just a matter of capitalization. When you read the translations where the D is capitalized, we're talking about the Tao, whereas when it's underlined or when it's lowercase, it's just basically what you just said, that phrase, which I can't ashamedly say back at you. Um, and secondly, my comments, uh, obviously, I think in terms of music, so ignore if you don't like music. Otherwise, that's what I do in chat. All right. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tai. Uh, yeah, I just have another discussion with uh, uh, another person about the translation of the Tao Te Ching. Uh, yeah, he's telling me about the Tao and a Tao, the difference. Okay, so yeah, I, I think I should pay attention on that. But unfortunately, Chinese writing has no capital letters, no the or a, uh, so basically all say Tao. So I have to find a way to find out what, uh, what the text means. So, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lindsay, please. At the end of War and Peace, Tolstoy has a lecture on historical on history itself. And one of the things that puzzled him was how a single man like Napoleon could marshal this huge army and virtually conquer Europe. And he came up with God and a lot of other religious stuff. And so what I'm just suggesting here is that the Tao is a reference to that unifying force of nature because people do follow single individuals and their vision. And there's no real way of explaining that uh, broadly enough to explain, to, you know, to make sense of all of that. So the Tao sort of encompasses that sense of that power or whatever that unifies people behind a single individual. Yeah, th thank you. You know, I when I do this one, I kind of, not happy with the translation, so I start to look at different translation. One translation translate Tao here, 
uh, the translator make it as a moral law, okay? So that kind of like, you know, the law, the way to unify everybody together, you know, that's the translator's interpretation, you know, so uh, Rubana and the Kevin. Jason, you mentioned that people in, right now in modern China or the Chinese culture, they still un understand this, um, this book and the philosophy behind it. Uh, with the Chinese, the, and I'm talking about mainland China, I, I guess you're from Taiwan, you mentioned Taiwan. So um, the way they are um, using the military to attack and get land from India, and the way they are using their power, uh, economic power uh, to build relationships with countries that the uh, United States was never able to. Are they following this philosophy in, in two fronts? Well, okay. First, uh, I, 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 I try not to answer this one because everybody will have their own opinion. But uh, this book is more on the philosophical side. And the, the purpose, I think the personal purpose, I will share this one with everybody, is we can all together, or every individual can find the answer okay, to your question, rather than I answer the question, because everybody will have their own thinking. Yeah, that's yeah, too bad. I, I try not to answer this question, because everybody can have his own answer or her own answer. Uh, Kevin, please. Thank you, Jason. And uh, I just posted one link. We talk about the uh, from Dow. Uh, Dow generate. Uh, uh, that's the last. Uh, I'm going to read one off. Uh, they talk about the Dow having Earth a general those uh, relationship. Let's say my uh, one suggestion when we try let's say learn chinese philosophy oh, oh thank you sharing okay. uh yeah yeah this is chapter the end of them you see you see the first one they see man follows earth earth follows heaven heaven follows Tao. Tao follows what is in nature here let's see Sun Tzu didn't talk about his nature that's about for my personally i, I consider the uh, Tao De Jin as um, foundation you can understand other philo philosopher or chinese that's this is very connected the different understanding different focus and the by one, one common increase on a chat i hear like interest you can let's when we read the contact think about uh, the recent news about afghanistan the war we should not happen in the first place what do we get so that's like you know it's it, it is just so big topic. I don't want to, you know, go into yeah, politics, but yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, but before this one, I, I kind of think about probably a lot of people talk about Afghanistan, but yeah, you can talk about this, but you know, just hold your personal opinion. Yeah, no <laughs> personal it, opinion for me. Okay. Very you know, thank you. I just share with uh, our team. Let's do uh, the, you know, that's uh, the, the chapter 25 in Do, the five translations. They talk about those things. That's so, so important from the Tao uh, heaven all the way, then to the earth itself, then generous people, then uh, how then uh, the method we use the technical side. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Thank you. Okay, on chapter one, I just want to say that this one is very important. But actually, we spend a lot of time on this one, but I think that that's probably worth it because this one is the very important on the chapter and the very uh, first chapter of the book. So if I think we have a fully discussed on this one, it, I, I think we, it, pay, it pays, okay, the price, we, you know, the time we spend, I think it works. Just uh, quickly on the deception, that's also on the chap chapter one, on the very end, we talk about the deception. The, the military, not only the, 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 the beginning talk about the positive and then talk about the deception side, the way of deception, okay? So this one used the Tao again, but this Tao is a Tao, probably not the Tao, okay? So this, when able manifest the inability, when it's active, manifest the inactivity. 
So basically it's cheating when near manifest as far when far manifest here. So the blah, 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 blah. But the final sentence is important. I say important because it's in the Chinese speaker's daily conversation. Attack when he is unprepared, emerge where he does not expect, it, not expect. So this word is in the, all the Chinese speakers daily, I say daily, it's a very common uh, conversation. It's not, you don't have to read Sun Zi, okay, to, under, to, to learn this word, but everybody knows this word. Attack where he is unprepared, emerge where he does not expect. It. So any question? Okay, so let's move on to the chapter two. All right. So chapter two, I only include one sentence, okay? Because in the aside reading, there's no uh, quote on the uh, chapter two. So I think that's important because it give a, a, a warning sign, okay? Remember at the beginning, the first one is just talk about the general idea that about the war, okay? How important and uh, of going to war. It's life and the death, survival and the extinct. So how important and everything should be there, put in your mind, okay? We assume uh, Sun Tzu is talking to the general, okay, the chief commander. So then chapter two, give a warning sign. I think that's also important. I think Pin or somebody already men mentioned in this one. In, in war, then let your great, uh, let your great object be victory not then see campaign, right? So your only goal is victory, okay? If you go to war, not the then see campaign. So you take too long, that's the problem. So this, it may be known that the leader of the army is the arbiter of the people's faith, the man on whom it depends on whether the nation should be in peace or in peril. So it's give a warning sign to the commander, okay? The, uh, the chief, the commander in chief, Okay, so it's a warning, okay? You, your goal is winning. Don't take too long, okay? And that's people's fate and the, the nation, it's peace and take, uh, the danger all depend on you. So that's a warning sign. Uh, Joe, please. So the problem I have with this is very few people, very few generals go into a war or political leaders expecting a long war. The, uh, the whole idea for going into the war is it's going to be over very quickly. And this is usually what they intend. So the notion that, you know, who, who actually plans to spend 15 years in war? I mean, I, I don't think that's, if you can give me an example, I'd like to hear it. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Anybody want to answer? <laughs> um, I think Raytheon wouldn't mind spending 50, 15 years in war, you know, so... Uh, just, but Raytheon is not a general, but go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just mean some people will make a lot of money out of war. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to go, go, go long, but I think personal, I think his point is, you know, shorten the, uh, the events and focus on the win. And probably, I think later on, uh, uh, chapter four, he, well, the clear definition of okay, what's meaning win, right? If we don't have a clear definition, that's why you will last a long time. Just a personal thought. We have a lot of hands up. Uh, okay, uh, please make it stick with the subject. Okay, and then we have to move on. Let's go from the top of my screen. Pin, uh, pin, feel, Thai, and uh, Rubana, Mark. Okay, pin, please. Oh, uh, yeah, another great question from Joe. I would say, uh, that's why chapter one, the emphasis, you know, sons has said on calculation before you engage in war. And of course, he means an accurate calculation, not just one that you, uh, you're trying to fool yourself. So, and you know, another famous saying is, the more, the more you calculate, the more often you will win. Uh, the less you calculate, the less often you will win. If you don't calculate, you always lose. And, uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, Theo, please. Yeah, unfortunately, we quite often don't, uh, because I think we believe we know more than the other, we don't <laughs> understand that they're also making their calculations. So if we don't understand their calculation, 
that's exploiting our weakness, we could lose because we expect a quick war, such a shock and awe, and it turns out that it turned out differently. So shock and awe does not always work because we only think that we have the advantage, but in fact, sometimes we don't. So there you go. Uh, beware of your own, be, beware of your own arrogance and understand your uh, humility. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, that's in the uh, chapter four. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, who's next? Uh, Ty, please. Uh, just very briefly, um, I, I tend to agree with the speaker who brought up Raytheon. Um, I would argue General Powell, for instance, uh, lied to the entire United Nations about uh, I, you know, <laughs> weapons of mass destructions. And indeed, it was General Eisenhower who reminded us that we must uh, stay very, I guess, mindful of, of uh, the military industrial complex. And that is all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, if you have to comment this, please make it short. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, next, Mark and Chris. Yeah, thank you, um, Jason. I wanted to address the question about does anyone plan for a long war? And I think generally the speaker who brought that up is correct that often there's a lot of nationalistic arrogance. The prelude to World War I was particularly famous for that, um, with everyone saying they'd be done by Christmas. And Hitler was famous for telling his generals about the invasion of the Soviet Union. You have only to kick in the, the door and the whole rotting structure will come collapsing in. So there's a lot of quotes like that that are, that are wrong. But those are usually of like very powerful um, forces. Guerrilla forces or insurgent forces often have a different conception of war. And so I want to read a quote from Ho Chi Minh on this topic. He says, our resistance will be long and painful, but whatever the sacrifices, however long the struggle, we shall fight to the end until Vietnam is fully independent and reunified. Um, and I've read other things like that too, uh, particularly from insurgent fighters that understand that they can't defeat their opponent in a, in a flat out fight, but that they, that they can wear them down through like a, a superior resolve. So I, th I think it, the, the speaker is generally right, but that's not always the case. There are political actors and military actors who do understand the value of uh, persistence. Thank you. Uh, who's next? Uh, Chris, please. Yeah, so um, I, I, people need to look at this from uh, uh, the writer's perspective, right? Mm -hmm. So, in his time and for quite a while after him, right? The preferred method of conducting warfare, it's siege warfare. So because most times uh, the battle taking place is not too bad, you know, it's not two uh, armies on the battlefield, it is one, one army is sitting behind the walls in the castle and then the other army is trying to breach the castle. It's kind of brainless because everybody knows the drill, how to do a siege warfare. Basically, the army that's sieging the castle is trying to starve the people in the castle out, right? And the castle inside, the people inside are trying to wait for the other party to run a supply on the outside. So it's a war attrition. So what he's really saying here is he's saying, look, don't be so uh, conventional. Don't be so lazy in your thinking, right? Try to be creative. Try to be more efficient because... That is the true victory because you don't want to win a long drawn out victory where even if you won, your own resources and the people that you conquer are severely depleted. You know, in the end, you really won nothing. You know, you because both have lost so much that the, the victory is empty. I think that is really a key uh, point here. Um, he is not talking, an audience too, he's not only saying this to the commander, right? On the second sentence where he says the general is the arbiter of the safety uh, and, and the survival of the state, he's really addressing the emperor, right? And the king, he's saying, select your general well, okay? Because, you know, uh, that is the key determining factor whether you and your own country will survive or not, right? Because he has seen plenty of incompetent generals, right, in his time, um, and then the last thing I think, just addressing the last two points on the the privatization of war, um, a long war will always benefit the natives, 
that's 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 true throughout human history, right? So the, the longer the war goes, the better it is for the natives because you're already there. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Rupanda? Someone brought up uh, Ho Chi Minh and I don't, um, in my history uh, class years ago, I had learned that um, Johnson had uh, offered Ho Chi Minh a lot of money to stop the war and he couldn't understand it and land in the United States. Why, what was it? Why would he stay in a little hut and fight instead of taking all this money that he was being offered? And um, the, the speaker right before me is right that the reason Taliban won is because they are the natives. They can wait out, they can wait for generations. It's and the and, uh, um, invading army, quote unquote, invading army uh, always loses at the end. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, who's next? Uh, Shavana? Uh, Shavang. Yeah, Shavang. Yeah. Yeah. There's some. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. Great to see you here. Yeah. So I had a question like uh, in this philosophy, when the, the armies go for war, uh, do they? Uh, what about the other sections of the society, like the farmers and men and women who are not soldiers? Are they left alone? Like uh, they continue with uh, their day-to-day -day life, and only the armies engage in war? Well, um, yeah, I think this one is more on the philosophical uh, discussion. And then uh, it's right in 2,500 years ago, and uh, the war is very different than today. But I think that the Thai Chinese in te technology probably more advanced than the Europe. So at the time, I believe uh, China, the people, the general enemies are able to wage much large scale war than the uh, Western because the advanced on the technology, which is the iron. Okay, that's my understanding, yeah. Uh, who's next, Pim, Kevin, and uh, Lindsay. Okay. Uh, yeah, just uh, really just echoing some of the points made by others. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, if you read the entirety of chapter two, uh, Sons, I, I agree, is talking about really uh, the long, waiting long wars where you're uh, sending an expedition to invade another, uh, to invade uh, a foreign nation. And uh, uh, it, it also makes the point of, so it talks a lot about the logistical cost. And uh, uh, also to just echo the point that uh, a long war is the, the indigenous uh, uh, forces at an advantage. And, and that actually, uh, throughout Sun Tzu, uh, he talks a lot about that, uh, that uh, the defender, uh, the, the, the native, the, the indigenous defender um, has a natural built-in advantage. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Kevin and Lindsay. Yes, thank you. I want to share one uh, Chinese word, Zha. It's uh, more old days. It's uh, left side is uh, the skin of animal, right side is uh, like uh, uh, spear. Basically, we fight with animal for the food, you know, that kind. And the modern day we understand the word is stop war. Left side is like stop, side is the weapon. That's the that. Now here, a second point is about, say general want to uh, long, uh, uh, long last war. Nobody want to that. Any people say they want to, you know, immediately, three day, one day. It's, it's nobody wants that. However, we keep changing our interest. For example, uh, Afghanistan, we already, you know, we initiated why it happened. A second, let's see, uh, 2011, we already captured the island, right? We got to well, achieve the goal, initial goal, but you change your interest. Okay, we want to build some 
something uh, democracy or our value from from local people native people we impose something to them so that's uh, another big uh, in the world side we it called the pe people mind okay. that's yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you yeah please but I you know, I, I would like to focus on the uh, text. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, thank you, please. Yeah. What I was noticing, or what I think is what's going on here that might be lost somewhere along the line, is that I think that Sun Tzu is writing uh, advice and observations about war from the point of view of the aggressor, not the defender. This is not a book of defense. This is a, a book of attack and victory. And so what Ho Chi Minh said that he should write a book about the, the art of defense instead of the art of war. So I think when he's, when he's talking about war, he means aggressive war, because that's what a lot of this, like this here, let your great object be victory, not lengthy campaign. Well, the Americans made a huge mistake because they, they they didn't, they thought they were going to get, they didn't know enough about the enemy, which is what you pulled up a little while ago and highlighted. They went in without following the advice that he's got in this book about how to be an aggressor. Well, I don't know if we're going to get to that later on or not, but that's, so I think that's where, where we need to kind of see this. This is advice for an aggressor army, not a defensive <laughs> army. Thank you, Lindsay. You know, when you are talking about this, I think you might be right. You know, I probably not thinking about too much on this. You know? yeah. So yeah, thank you for reminding me. You know? That's why I always say that non-Chinese, uh, when I run this meetup, I actually, I learned a lot from different opinions because you see the different angle from different culture. So I don't know how much you learn from this, but I, just can tell everybody. I learned a lot by everybody's coming. Yeah. Um, Madeline, please. Yes, uh, thanks, Jason. This is great. Uh, my question, I cannot resist uh, one, one translation question. Uh, I had read somewhere that uh, the art of war, that in, in Chinese, it actually is more like craft or technique and that it would be more analogous to the Greek word techni rather than what we think of now as fine art? Well, okay, this one is a big question, okay? And I, I just have to share a lot of my view on this one. Uh, the whole project I'm running every week, I've announced stuff for a long time. I think that's, I would suggest everyone to give up all the article, whatever people commentary talk about. That's, that's why I always bring the original. Hey, let's have a fresh understand. What are they talking about? Okay, so that's, and uh, stop to, that, that, that actually that's my purpose. That's why I always bring the original. A lot of people talk about many things. That's questionable. Okay. So thank you, Madame. <laughs> Madame, Madame yeah. uh, Pin, please. Yeah, I just want to clarify, in Chinese, there's no such thing as art of war for a book name without name. In Chinese, this book is just uh, named Sun Tzu. The, uh, art of war is really an, a name given by the West. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, we, uh, Chinese just called Sun Tzu. If you tell art of war, yeah, I think that's uh, too romantic, romanticize uh, this book. You know? Yeah, you are right. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to chapter three. I include a lot on the chapter three, but probably we don't have time to go in too much. But here, I think that's an important message, okay? Uh, chapter three talk about the uh, 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 basis of the planning, how to plan in a war. Okay, I include a few uh, uh, quotes on this one. So basically talk about victory without fighting. So he talked about the, uh, in the, pract the practical art of war, right? Uh, the art, yeah, just thanks for pin, uh, pin uh, 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 reminding. It's not at all basic, it's technique, okay? So the better to take enemy. So basically you, he wants you to take the whole, okay, of the country, the army, 
the battalion, the company, the squad will depend on your label instead of like a fight one by one. You, the best way is to take a whole, okay? So the, the idea, so here he said to fight and the quarrel in all your better. If you win on, you, you won 100 battles, okay? Every battle you won, it's not sprint excellence, okay? Because you still go to the war. Okay. The spring exercise consists in breaking the enemy's resistance before fighting. So if you really actually go to the fight, the, the war, just like Lindsay said, you know, this one for the aggressor, if you really send the military to other people's country, to other country, you are on the second hand. You are not on the spring excellence. The spring says they do it before you send the military. So that's the key message here. Let me move on. There's no hands up. So we talk about four ways of fighting. Okay. So okay. So basics. It's a little. So the 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 best. Okay. The superior military is balk the military the enemy's plan. Okay. Before you really do it. Okay. When they when the enemy is in the planning stage, you already stop it. The second best is break down the enemy's alliance. Okay. The third level will be attacked the, en the enemy's army. And the worst case is go to city by city to fight. So Sun Tzu already laid down, okay? The ideal situation, the spring, so-called uh, uh, spring, the spring excellency is to break in the enemy resistance without fighting, okay? So how do you do it without fighting? You before when enemy is planning, you already stop their plan, okay? You break down enemy's alliance, okay? So when you have to send the military, it's already in the low level of uh, uh, strategy of the military. Uh, Chris, please. Yeah, I think, uh, no, I'm just trying to remember from um, how I read the Chinese version. I think the meeting is a little bit different, the, uh, especially the last two, right? I think, I think that's an actual technical comment. So he's basically saying that it's better to engage your enemy in the open field. And the worst ah. you can do is do siege warfare. This is very tactical. It is not, it's not going to city to city. It's more like, because once you engage in siege warfare, basically everything we just talked about like 10 minutes ago comes into play, right? You need to, do, it's gonna be long drawn out. You need dig trenches, you need to build catapults, and lots of people will die, and you need a, a huge supply chain, right? If you can engage the enemy in open field, even if you lose, you still get a decision, and then you can you know, decide to try again, retreat, regroup, but you're not going to waste so much of your own resources. So an open field battle is always superior than siege warfare. I think that's what okay. he said. Chris, you read in Chinese or read in the one of translation? I read in Chinese. But it doesn't say so. So, so Gong Cheng, Gong Cheng is siege warfare. It's not yeah. going to city to attack. So okay. And how about Fa Bing? Does it mean the open field? Yeah, yeah. That just be Fa Bing. It just be, means like engagement. You're doing open engagement, right? Okay. Yeah, I take your explanation. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's the way to to look at. Yeah, yeah. I see some translation said. Uh, 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 the battle is uh, fighting in the open field, and uh, then the 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 worst thing is it's it's uh, uh, attacked the city, something like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Madeline and uh, Adina. Yeah, it seems that um, the the economy of action and the principle of the best victory is to never have fought at all seems to be very much about Wu Wei, which I know I'm not pronouncing correctly. Um, the concept of Wu Wei, as we've discussed it in the Taoist group, is economy of action, doing as little as possible to achieve the goal. And I was just uh, taking a quick look in Wikipedia, and it looks as if this text arose at the same time in the spring and autumn period, at the same time as the concept the sort of cultural concept of Wu Wei did. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a comment, but it's mostly a question. Um, 
is, is, is that, the, are they using Wu Wei in the text here? And um, would it be a concept that had, had arisen around the same time? Uh, well, I think the Wu Wei concept probably is, is still around today, you know, uh, at least that's my, I believe, you know. So uh, does it have a concept of Wu Wei? I think yes, you know, and uh, the, uh, if you read the Han Fei, somebody claimed uh, Han Fei also had the concept of Wu Wei, even the, the very terrible Chinese uh, legalism. Okay, so he had the two chapter inter uh, interpretation of the Tao Te Ching. So, the, of course, it's not today, only today. Every day we talk about Chinese culture, you also can think about the Tao. You know, are they similar? Is the concept of Wu Wei how to, imp in, how to be used in different people? Uh, who's next? Uh, Arena, then Pin, and Phil. Um, I like a lot the, um, the superior military um, concepts of confusing and bulk the enemy's plans. So, so being um, a very authentically unpredictable. So because of, we we all like. To, to calculate and make plans and predict how things are going to turn out. And in this particular case, very often, once we take completely unprepared action, it creates amazing results. So such as, for instance, going back in history to Napoleon's uh, invasions so of and Napoleon suddenly realizes that Russian forces abandoned the capital city, Moscow, and he, and left him the key and no supplies and no, no basically, uh, um, just he was confused and he wasn't, he wasn't, he just, uh, he was puzzled, like what happened? Why is no one fighting me? And in reality, the plan was to bring Napoleon forces as, my, as, as far as possible into Russian territory and then the, the you use the um, lack of supplies and the weather for uh, elements and such. So it's just uh, this this uh, particular element of being unpredictable, and so no one else could calculate your intent. It just very often creates amazing results. To what I've seen, um, and but uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a very I just love the concept. It's just really you have to apply it more in life. That's what, how I feel it. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Pin. You are muted. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I just wanna. I was really glad uh, Madeline brought up the the point of the relationship to Wu Wei, uh, because I, I, that's one thing I find uh, since the, uh, another aspect that's very interesting. I see relationships, philosophical relationships, both with Taoism and uh, Confucianism. Uh, as far as I know, the text never says Wu Wei. But, you know, in reading the text, I, I think in spirit, I find a lot of Taoist kind of Taoist mode, I don't know how to say, you know, kind of um, breaking conventional wisdom kind of expressions and kind of doing the opposite. You know, you want this result, but you approach it by doing the opposite. And, um, and things like talking about yin yang. Uh, and uh, so I, I do see a Taoist kinship but at the same time, I also see some Confucianist uh, expressions. You know, like he talks about the five virtues of the general. Well, three of them are the three, uh, three uh, what, what Confucius said is uh, kind of the three universal virtues, the san da de, zi zhen yu, uh, wisdom, lin, and courage. And then he had, uh, he had the two more. Uh, trustworthiness and discipline that are more related to being a military leader. So I, I um, it's kind of a, it embodies, you know, kind of, uh, uh, different schools of thought at that time. 
Thank you, Ben. Uh, who's next? Uh, here, please. Yeah, I, I, I hate to sing the hymn to Stalin, but nonetheless, he did use item one and two brilliantly at the end of World War II. Because during the invasion, the Western invasion, we were moving to Berlin, and the objective was to hit the Berlin and defeat Hitler as soon as possible. But Russia, instead of doing that, spent its time conquering the Balkans. And particularly when he was in Warsaw, he, uh, what the, when the Polish army pleaded for, with him to come and expel the Nazis, he waited until they were defeated and then move into Poland. In addition, he used number two well, because unbeknownst to Franklin Roosevelt, he and the British had a secret agreement how to divide the Balkans, that he would take the majority of the Balkans, the British would take be the influence in Greece because the British wanted to protect their a province in the Middle East. And when Franklin Roosevelt found this out, he was outraged because you know he was clueless. And Stalin was already planning the next war, which was the Cold War, while he was fighting, while we were all fighting the Second World War. So he, he was way ahead in the planning of the next war. And he was also breaking down the alliance, an alliance we thought was unbreakable between Britain and the United States to how to divide the Balkans and the, and the Eastern Europe. So there you go. I mean, it could be used brilliantly by the villain as well as the hero. Well, thank you, Pin. Uh, uh, Chris, please. Yeah, I think people may have said it right. I just wanna make sure that there's no confusion here, right? Like I think Wu Wei, doesn't mean taking, I mean, another translation says like no action, you know, taking no action, but it means, it really means like effortless like, action, right? I mean, you're doing the action within the flow of things. So I mean, it may like looks like, you know, like you're not exerting a lot of effort, but you're still doing stuff. You might be doing a lot of stuff. So I, I think that that cannot be like underemphasized. So like, there's a lot of work uh, in the first two, it's not like, oh, you know, like, uh, I'm just, you know, it's good to, to not having the other person start a war with me to achieve that end. You're going to have to do a lot of stuff. You're going to do tons of negotiating. You got to do tons of backwater, you know, back, you know, back channel diplomacy. You may have to apply economic pressure. You had to, you may have to do like, you know, a carrot and stick. There's just so much more work. It's not the same as going to the battlefield and die, but the you know the effort it might be the same or, or more, right? You know, depends on the person. So I think uh, uh, I just want people to kind of get that, right? Like if you think about Wu Wei in that way, that you're doing lots and lots of action, but you're just doing the flow. I think that's a good way to use Wu Wei. But if you're saying no action, I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's correct. I don't. Yeah, think yeah, thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's a Wu Wei is a big concept, you know? same as like if you read Confucius, to talk about Ren, the, the benevolence or Xiao, filial piety. Actually, the the interpretation is very rich. So uh, we we will get there, you know. So thank you, Chris, for reminding us. The first two doesn't mean you do nothing. That means <laughs> you do a lot of smart things. Okay, let's move to the. Uh, Another part talk about uh, how do you know you can win? Okay, that, that's that's the title I put in. Okay, so you put a uh, uh, five things you need to know. Okay, so you know when to fight and when not to fight, and how to handle both the superior and the inferior, inferior force. Okay? You have to know the army is in, in the, the whole army is inspired by the same spirit throughout all ranks. 
he who prepared himself wait to take the enemy unprepared. Um, the general is capable and the ruler is not interfering. Okay, I think the last one is important. It put point out the general is in the field and the ruler is not interfering. What uh, general doing? So this one is kind of lay out uh, five things. Uh, uh, how how you know you can win? Uh, Fred, please. Yeah, number five, like you say, is important and it's something we need to keep in mind when we're reviewing these and its applicability to, uh, to modern warfare in our situation. Uh, because, uh, we, but because we are so heavily reliant on politics to set strategy and goals. Military is, is relatively hamstrung what they can do. Military is well aware of the art of war. As, as you may know, there's been a sea change in military training uh, after the Vietnam War, where we rely on, um, on C3 operation, operational intelligence up and down the command chain. And there is a lot of flexibility, uh, tactical flexibility in the field. However, most of these stratagems rely on uh, the ability to follow out this, to follow the strategy. And we are uh, uh, in modern warfare, certainly at the US, um, the ruler is very definitely interfering. The ruler is setting the goals and determining all sorts of operational limits. And so, uh, so we have, we have to keep that in mind when we think about these, uh, particularly if we're lo looking at this and saying, oh, you know, uh, in the modern field, uh, our enemies are so superior applying the art of war and, and we, we just bungled it. Uh, our military is very well aware of the art of war. They teach it in the, the war college. Uh, it's just that they are very have also very heavily constrained in what they can do. They do not have that cap. The general is not capable of setting strategy. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, uh, Pin and um, uh, Metary. Pin, please. Uh, yes, uh, a couple of things. Yeah, thanks, Fred, uh, for mentioning that. Yeah, I, I do believe it's also in the um, curriculum of West Point Academy, uh, Sun Tzu. And also on the required reading list of all um, military, U.S. military commanders up, uh, above a certain rank. And uh, at the, all the libraries of the different U.S. Uh, foreign commands, I think it's also a required uh, book on the shelf. Um, the number five, I think it's a kind of uh, illustration of how Wu Wei, the spirit of Wu Wei, uh, comes in Sun Tzu. Um, compare this, the general is capable and the ruler is not interfering with one of the chapters in Lao Tzu uh, that starts with uh, the, su the supreme kind of uh, ruler is the kind where uh, people under uh, don't even know who that person is. Right. And then and then it talks about the the, the lesser one, the lesser one, you know, each 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 level down as a ruler, the more interfering the, the and abusive the the ruler is. Um so I, I see you know this example where I see embodiment of Taoism in Sun Tzu. And uh uh item number one here I think is a mantra of Chairman Mao, uh his famous mantra that don't don't fight a battle that you're not certain you're going to win. I think is a, a good uh, annotation of, uh, of number one here. Okay, thank, uh, thank you, Pin. Uh, who's the next one? Uh, Madeline, uh, Phil, and uh, Tai. Uh, I, um, I thought Fred's point was a very good one because uh, I had been thinking earlier that this was written uh, 
about a, a smaller region than what we think of as modern day China. It was basically written about the area that we think of as Northern China, approximately. And it was written in an era that was more like, think of England before there was a unified monarchy. So a, a, a number of different small baronies who were all warring for power. The barons might depose each other. There might be succession problems within a barony, whatever was going on, but they weren't electing a new baron every four to eight years. And the baron wasn't also governed by an assembly of you know, hundreds of people who were elected by millions of people. So the conditions of, of the ruler interfering um, are, are really quite different unless you are taking um, the business approach of a company and say like, we'll let the CEO do what he, what he does and the uh, board members are gonna sit back and just let him do his job and not interfere. It still makes sense in that context, but not so much in a modern democracy where um, as Fred's point it was that it's very hard to sustain any sort of long-term strategy, not just about war, but about anything. Uh, because it keeps shifting back and forth, and not just in the U.S., but in other countries as well. All right, thank you, Madeline. You know, I'm sorry I have to, uh, uh, look, guys, I cannot finish the thing as usual. Uh, I will schedule another one, but let me quickly finish 3.6, and uh, then uh, uh, which one is not, uh, I think it's fear, all right? Did I feel mentioned about this one? So that's a very important message, right? You talk about like, you have to know yourself and uh, know the enemy, then you don't have to fear, okay? About any war, any battle. If you know yourself, you don't know the enemy. If you want, okay? Everyone, you will have a chance, uh, one lose. If you don't know yourself and don't know your enemy, you always lose. So that's the, the final message. You know, we try to deliver on this chapter three on this one. So uh, I think we have to uh, uh, pin. Are you able to host for me for the discussion? Oh, I, I can stay uh, for, for a little while. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I have some engagement today, so I have to leave earlier. So uh, I will have a pin uh, host the uh, uh, continue discussion if you willing to stay. Thank you so much. And I'm sorry, usually I can stay longer, but today I have three, uh, three of us. Uh, so uh, pin, can you uh, please host? And then we uh, welcome to stay to continue discussion. And uh, Phil, I think Phil and the Tai are the next. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks Thank so much, Jason. This was great as usual. Yeah, I don't know. We are. Uh, we have so much interest on that, so I should schedule some boring stuff like Confucius. So, <laughs> so I can on my schedule. So uh, next week, Pete is going to talk about the uh, the for the, uh, the history of Chinese philosophy. Okay, and then later on, we're going to talk about Confucius. Then, okay, so that's what we are going to do. So thank you for joining us. And then uh, let's keep continue. Yeah, Pin, that's your hand, uh, all yours. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, actually, yeah, I can only stay till 3.15. I also have another engagement. Uh, apologies in advance. So uh, Phil, you're next and then Ty. Yeah. I, I when I raised my hand was for 3.5 or the 3.6, I'll just say this one thing that number five uh, no longer applies because, and, and, and this sort of follows Madeline's, but, but in a different way, because the world is much more complex. Uh, I mean, uh, and in addition, we have the problem of the military industrial complex. The two things is, for instance, during the Vietnam War, I mean, the Korean War, uh, if you have left it to the general, 